Hi, this is Eddie Beeson. You're listening to Breaking the Fourth Wall. I was Mandark in Dexter's laboratory. Ha 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 ha
and such for a while. And then one of the guys was going through a tough divorce and it kind of all imploded. Oh. And noticed the, and noticed the trend. I was like, all right, but when somebody else is in charge. It's very easy for it to fall apart. Right. So that was about 20 and the end of 2018 when that fell apart, which was sad. We were, it was about 10,000 downloads a, a month. Oh, wow. You know, so like we were, you know, we had, and we had, then we worked at that for like five years. <laughs> so like, we, you know, it was, it was a long time. Seeing it uh, fall apart was tough. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do this again. It's got to be my thing and it's got to be my vision for it. And, you know, just kind of run with it. So that's where the scenes, the scene snobs actually started as me uh, writing written reviews on Facebook okay. in 2012. And that was all it was. And then I just took the name and made a website. And, and during all this, you were still uh, pursuing the, uh, the independent film. Uh, well, I was, still, I was consulting because I still worked for uh, a production company in Los Angeles. I did budgets and scheduling and such for him, uh, okay. his TV shows and things like that. So I was, I was very fortunate um, to be able to leave, but still have a connection where I could work. Okay. All right. And uh, again, when, when you go to that route and, and again, I'm, I'm basing these questions off of a uh, personal experience. Cause when, uh, when, when breaking the fourth wall, which was the show that I started um, became realm of the mist entertainment. A, and, and I started networking other shows that, that I either helped create or I helped promote uh, or whatever else and, and wound up needing to create a network a lot of times I try to make it where, and this, this is what struck me about what you said. A lot of times I, I tried to make it where it was like everybody was, was realm of the mist. It wasn't just it, realm of the mist. wasn't mine. It was everybody's, you know what I mean? I wanted to make it feel like it was a family environment and four times in a row that wound up biting me in the ass. Um, so I'm really interested in what you said about how you, when you decided to create uh, the scene snob, that this was yours, and and I'm wondering how how that dynamic works with the people that you uh that you have on on your network on your programs, uh in the aspect of like uh do they feel like it's they're still creative uh creatively free to do the show as they wish, or is there a stingent within your company that that you know this is your rules your laws and this is the way they got to be? I mean I'm curious how, how the dynamic works. Uh, well, it's very much, you know, they understand that uh, when it comes to the scene songs, there's, some, there's certain image, certain things like, uh, you know, I want to try and uphold and they, uh, they're very cool about it. It's about center, surrounding myself around people I trust and I, you know, that I can work with. And uh, I do allow for a lot of creativity. I never want to stifle anybody's creativity. Um, we have meetings, we talk. So like there's that understanding, that openness that I'm like, you know, Rob paints the movies, which is our painting show. That was Rob's idea. Okay. And it's he and his wife that hosted. I'll program the show, but he and his wife hosted. And as long as he understands, like, all right, this is just, I need you to do this for the scene sounds. But the show is yours. So run with the show. But, like, you know, I'm producing it and putting it out and such. So, like, he gets that. He understands, he understands that dynamic. And everybody else, all my other co-hosts and, um, you know, there's only one other show I have called Pulling Focus Podcast, which is a filmmaking podcast. Uh, that is a completely 100% 50-50 partnership with uh, my good buddy, uh, and he runs uh, Skyline Indie Film Festival okay. uh, here in Virginia. So we every, we split everything 50-50. All the work goes 50-50 to plan everything. Um, now with the scene snobs, I take on all of, you know I take on all the burden. So I think it's kind of understood by everybody who's, who's joined in like you know i'll you know kind of not how i what i say goes but you know they understand like why i'm doing it i'm very open about it and i'll take care of them you know just as much and you know allow them to be as creative as possible with the shows and stuff like that because honestly i'd rather them take over certain shows right and run with them because like i trust them to do that so I told him, I was like, I'm only on here because I have fun doing it. It's like, but if you guys have ideas, go for it. You know, it's, you know, that's it. Like, so I, I think it's just a matter of, you know, being respectful of everybody. And, you know, they understand what I'm trying to build. 
I, I trust me, I 100% agree with you. In fact, I'm finding a kindred spirit in what you're saying right now, again, because uh, some of the shows, like, when, when in its heyday, Realm of the Mist Entertainment had a plethora of different shows. I mean, we had things that dealt with Star Wars. We had things that dealt with uh, conspiracy theories. We had a show devoted, uh, devoted to the trans community. You know, like, we went everywhere. The only thing we didn't go was politics obviously in religion because that's just two places you just don't go if you want to make sure you have a solid audience uh, audience fan base but uh you know and it, it, it i loved the diversity of it i loved uh thinking of the channel and the, the 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 network of being something for everybody almost like a like almost like a buffet you know there was at least something on there that you would like even if you didn't like everything we produced and so you know, that, that was something I always tried to strive for. Is that pretty much the same scenario for you? Like, uh, even though everything is kind of uh, film eccentric, it, it, you try to make sure there's a, uh, a podcast for somebody out there. Oh yeah. And even it's, it's grown past the, you know, the, the movies and the pop culture and television you know, because we're adding new stuff constantly. Uh, like there's a marriage podcast I do there. I do on there with my wife and we found it, you know, very therapeutic to sit down and talk, but not just that, but to bring on other couples and talk. And we just did, uh, you know, actually it was Steve who uh, hooked it up, but uh, Artie Hoffman was on our show and he gave us a psychic reading. Nice. And, you know, a really nice guy. And it, it was good, but it was good to have that dynamic of uh, husband and wife going through it. And uh, kind of like, you know, our, exper our experiences there. Um, like with the filmmaking podcast is very much about supporting the indie, the indie effort. Like, so that would be for those, for them, you know, whoever's more about indie rather. I give a lot of tips on like, you're going to get into the industry, or you're looking for a way to get into the industry, this is a good way to go about it, you right. know, where, wherever you work. But yeah, for the most part, uh, there's only two shows I would say are specifically for me to have fun with. And that's my Friday Night Showcase, which is, uh, that's the talk show. That's like, think like Graham Norton type show. Okay. Come on, let's tell stories. I only invite people I'm interested in talking to. So musicians, artists, uh, you want to sing a song, sing a song, podcasters, things like that. Like, come on, let's have a good conversation. And uh, I, I invited a uh, film uh, film aficionado, uh, Trevor Stoudemire. Uh, this is second time on the show. And all we did was talk classic movies. And like, he's so intricate about knowing everything you know what the what the directors were doing and why they did this and it, I just listen. I'm like, I, if I can have fun doing it, I'm all about it. So. Well, now now I'm gonna now I'm gonna put you to the test too. After talking to a, a film aficionado, as I told you before we started recording, uh, I just did a uh, a roundtable podcast for SJ Network. Which, by the way, I'm pretty sure they would more than love to have you on. Uh, it's a bi-weekly show we we do called Coast to Coast Power Hour, and its main goal is to get different podcasters together and, and kind of just help self promote each other, you know, and lift each other up in, in one, one big pile of, of goop, I guess you could call the, the, the coast to coast power hour. Uh, last night we did, uh, and it just released today. So you can actually go see it. Um, but we, we sat down with a couple podcasters and uh, Scotty Schwartz from a Christmas story flick. Oh, nice. You know, the, wow. kid, the kid who licked the pole for, for people. <laughs> uh, and we were discussing 80s and 70s and 80s kid buddy films, things like The Goonies and, and uh, The Sandlot and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Stand By Me. And we were just the, the biggest crux that we were going into is could those style of films, not necessarily just the buddy kids, but the coming of age, feel good kid buddy films make a comeback in today's in today's film market uh of course you know we could stand on the fact that like needful or excuse me strange things and and it chapter one were very successful and of course they had kind of the coming of age feel but they were horrors you know i'm talking i'm talking the good old-fashioned just kids being kids and going off on an adventure yeah that you know that's those are great films uh and with the two that you mentioned, It and uh, uh, Stranger Things, and even going farther with uh, Summer of 84, which came out a few years ago, um, I don't think it could work today. I, you know, I think if you had a, a kid buddy film 
to work today, it'd look more like hackers. Right. A better version, <laughs> but like it, it, unfortunately, it's just kind of how it looked. Uh, as, and who knows how, what, what's going to happen with COVID and how that changes things, but, uh, you know, the look of things. But, uh, yeah, it's, unless you set it in the 80s or the 90s, I, it's, it's hard to imagine. I was telling my kid, my kid is eight, and I was like, man, this is a great uh, street for you to go play manhunt. How come you and your friends aren't playing manhunt? He's like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> you just want to you just want to play switch you know that's it mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, it it's just not the same like they ride their bikes to go play the switch you know <laughs> i would go out when the sun came up and wouldn't come home until i was yelled at you know that's what we were talking about on the show is uh if if and when we were old and if we were old enough to even have video game systems uh when we were a kid those were for rainy days or after you after dinner before bed you know, yeah. at the time you were you were outside your parents didn't even want to see you in the house you know? oh, yeah. <laughs> and there was no cell to... phones or anything to, to get to get you home it was you knew either when the street lights came on or as as scotty schwartz himself pointed out your mother would hang out the front door and scream at the top of her lungs get your ass home <laughs> oh, and i uh i would break things on purpose just enough so my father would get just man enough so I didn't have to do chores. He would send me out on a Saturday. He'd just yeah. get away from me. I don't want to see you until bed. I'm like, <laughs> okay, see you later. <laughs> you know, like I break a dish if I'm washing the dishes. And it's just like, get away from me. Go. All right. Well, well like I said on the show, I'm a, I'm a divorced father of three. So I only get my kid, uh, two of them, uh, on the weekend, every other weekend. And one thing I try to do, and I, I was doing this before we were divorced, but I mean, uh, one thing I always try to do, because my kids are the same way. My daughter's always got her nose in the phone and my son's always got his head in the switch. And uh, I try to make them every, th- uh, every weekend I have them, at least uh, weather permitting, at least one day we go out into the local park that we have here, which is kind of like a, a, a big wooded area. It's like a forest with a with a stream and everything. It's called Penny Pack Park. I mean, you're from Jersey. I'm sure you probably know it. Right. Um, we go out there all the time. We go swimming in the creek. We go exploring off the trails. And, you know, that that's something I try to do with my kids because I, I do. I want to break that habit of just everything's electronic and stupidity and get them to where they, you know, even when I have them on visits, like, take your ass outside. Go make some friends. Get into some sort of trouble and come back by dinner. You know what I mean? And I don't mean trouble by like, you know, gangs or, <laughs> or anything. I mean trouble by like go go have an adventure. <laughs> and that's the that's such a key thing too, is like kids need to be more adventurous. And what happens to the Indiana Jones spirit of when we were kids? Like oh, yeah. you go out and just try and discover something new mm-hmm. every day. And kids just they yeah, and I, I can't put kids down because they're very smart when it comes to technology. Um, and it's almost innate now, like they're born that way. But, uh, you know, like the other day, my, my kid's uh, friend came over on his bike, came up to the thing and it's beautiful outside. And he's like, Hey, can you come in and play the switch? I said, no, both of you get outside. Right. Go play. I don't care what you do. Just go play. And they did. They were out there for like two hours playing and they just, you didn't even, they didn't even think of that. Like I would never have wanted to be inside. <laughs> That was my that was my kids too. Like uh, the the like I said, the incentive uh, recently, especially after all the COVID thing, and it was a couple months before I got to see them because of the, you know the heavy lockdown and all that. My visitations were canceled until you know uh, until the the all clear could come around where they can come back. And one of the enticements of, of them, I was like, look, we're gonna go swimming. Well, oh, cool, we're gonna go to a pool. No, we're gonna go to the creek and go swimming. We're gonna we're gonna go catch trout with our hands. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it, 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 I try to instill them with that because I want them to pick. I think, I think that's something that's very much missing in today's society. You're right. Kids are intelligent. And anytime I have a phone or a computer issue, I ask my 10 year old, you know. <laughs> um, but when it comes to like life, and, and I think the big thing that's lost from, from this generation that we had was just using your imagination. I mean, I've sent my kids outside with a ball and they get bored in 10 minutes and want to come back in you know and you think back in the day when we got sent out with a ball what happened we were gone for hours we figured out we figured out that ball was yeah okay it was a baseball it was a basketball it's a dodgeball then we get bored with that and start it's a star it's a it's a death star you know what i mean (laughs) or whatever 
You know, we'd, we'd figure out things to do with this one simple object that our kids just look at and go, I don't get it. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, my father always said, um, like, you know, you take like a racquetball and he would, he would tell us, he's like, you know, what does this do? And he would always uh, equate the ball to teaching you diplomacy, teaching you politics, teaching, because you have to figure all those things out to figure out who's going to be on the team, who's going to do this, who's going to do that, who's the leader. Yeah, you know, and just one ball, trying to figure out what game you're going to play can teach you all of those things. And I always like kind of, that kept that in the back of my, my mind whenever he said that. I was like, yeah, it's true. Like back in the day, just a ball and you had hours of enjoyment and you were learning how to deal with things. <laughs> you know, you couldn't get a whole array of kids ready to play. Now, you, know, you never see it now. That's so. it. And you're, you're right. I mean, and the, the kids I do see, like I see, I see a group of kids around my neighborhood. And quite honestly, they piss me off. Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. They, they piss me off. <laughs> Because they're those kids where, like, they're riding the oversized tire bikes and they're doing the, uh, the, 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 the wheelie. And that doesn't bother me. Cool. Be adventurous. Ride your bike and all that, you know. But they're in the middle of the street. They have cars behind them and they won't get out of the cars as way of a busy street. And, and to me, it, it equates back to, one, the parents not teaching them right. But, two, they just don't know how to act out in, in public. Like, I remember playing street hockey with my buddies, and it's kind of a Wayne's World theme. But, you know, you and your buddies are taking over the whole entire street, but you see a car two blocks down. It's car. You're moving the net. You're getting out of the way. You let the car go, and it's game on, and you put it back, you know. <laughs> yeah, there is an etiquette that's lost. You're right. And I, I see that now, too, uh, just when I see kids riding a bike, and they're kind of in the way. And I'm like, I'm like come on. Get over. You know? <laughs> like, what are you doing? And – it is. It's like, a, it's like a lost art form like that we knew how to handle certain situations <laughs> like that they just don't get today. It's like it's a social thing that just like isn't implanted, I guess. And I, 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 I get, you know what? It, it confuses me. And, and maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong in this. And maybe maybe it's just me here. But it, it, it almost seemed like to me, you know, growing up and stuff, it, it, it's like nobody ever taught me that. You know what I mean? It's just something I knew like like it was it was in my DNA. And it seems like it's lost on this generation. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's, that's actually a great point because it, it is it's kind of lost. Like, we learned it from the older kids. We watched them play when we had to sit on the sidelines while they were playing mm -hmm. until we got our name call to come in. But we would see how they'd act. And then how they acted is when you finally took over, it was kind of how, you know, you just, that's what you did. Right. But there is like a lost connection. Like, there was, a, you know, maybe a generation, I don't want to say a generation, but in between us and in between the kids now playing, that they're becoming the parents now, that they weren't outside. Right. And they don't know that. They didn't learn that from our generation, I guess. So, just, <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, you're, a, you're a filmmaker. If you, I'll, I'll put this to you. Let's, let's play speculation for a little bit here. Kind of a, kind of a spitball on the wall and see what sticks moment here. Uh, you were tasked with the idea of coming up with a, a, a modern day kids buddy movie. How would you make the modern tech, technological uh, uh, monotony of today get these kids into a situation or scenario where they would have to go on a journey to go find a dead body on a train track? Yeah, that's a, uh... <laughs> it's a tough one but if i'm gonna do it thinking from the standpoint of like producing what's gonna work in the world like you know movies you know so if i'm gonna do a modern day i'm gonna take modern day kids and i'm gonna put them fish out of water in the past and they have to figure out how because now you have all these modern day kids who can't use their cell phones can't use their any other technology or anything, now they're in the past, maybe back to the future if they're meeting family members and they got to figure out how to make it work to get back or something like that. See, you know? I went the opposite way when I, when I posed this question on the, on the panel show. I said uh, these kids are trouble kids. They're, they're kind of the bad kids, kind of, kind of meatballs too, if you will, yes. uh, where they get sent on uh, 
they get sent to a camp for bad kids and not necessarily a prison, but kind of a juvenile detention center for bad kids where they have all that stuff taken away. And they, as they're trying to learn how to live in this society, this, uh, this little society or whatever is where they discover some sort of uh, rumor about something and they decide to go do it. And when they go to check out this rumor, they wind up getting lost in the woods or something. And then, that's where they learn the camaraderie and working together and, and problem solving that we all took for granted as kids, you know, to try to help find their way back without the help of modern technology. And I, I thought that would be a way we could possibly tell the story. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's such an interesting thing to do. Like how, how do you put the Sandlot in today's world? You can't like you, can you put the Goonies Sure. I mean, there, there'd probably be more technology to it nowadays, but, you know, if I'm, I'm going to say if you're going to do it, maybe have young parents involved, you know, who did grow up in that time, but like are out of touch with having to be that way. And now they're all stranded. Right. And then you kind of got a comedy of errors because they're trying to get through their kids. Like you can't use your cell phone. We have to figure this out. We have to, Playing around this and you know then you kind of got some you got the adults who are a little out of touch and how to do it you know uh yeah it's a great question it's a great i would love to see something interesting like because again stranger things and and all those movies and shows they set it in the 80s right because we don't have it now so like it's how do you do it it's it's kind of a crazy crazy world it really is it really, and, and it's funny because until, until I came up with this topic of conversation, I think I came up with it because I watched Explorers the other day. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, when I came up with the topic, I'm like, there really isn't. I mean, I, not discounting Stranger Things in It Chapter One, but like you said, they're in, they're in the past. They're not modern times. And, and so it's like, why don't they do it today? Why, you know, and... Quite honestly, I mean, even as cheesy as something as Monster Squad was, I, I think they still gave like a, a good moral compass for kids about the, the the value of friendship and problem solving and teamwork that you just really don't see presented for for a younger audience. Yeah, it's all based on video games now. Mm -hmm, so you don't see me up that way. You know, that'd be an interesting way to go. What's that? You know, having a, kids having to fight the monsters. Because you take these old school element monsters coming into the world today, and these kids can't just think their way out with technology. They're going to have to fight them at some point. You talking like the movie monsters, like Monster Squad, or are you talking like, yeah. uh, for for lack of a better term, kind of a Dungeons and Dragons cartoon show where the uh, kids took the roller coaster ride into the world of Dungeons and Dragons and had to figure it out. <laughs> well, essentially either or, uh, but instead of them going into the Dungeons and Dragons world and coming into our world. And these kids have to figure out how to fight them off or like a monster squad. Like if you take all the universal monsters and you put them in the world today and it, these kids are the only ones that know about it, they're gonna have to interact. They're gonna have to fight. They're gonna have to band together to do it. But maybe make the monster squad uh, a Facebook group or something. Right. Now, now they have to get together in real life, figure out how to work together to you know, beat these monsters. That'd be interesting, a monster squad too. And see, I'm, I'm going back, I'm thinking about the Goonies thing and you, you bring up a good one on that one, but that one I think would be almost kind of an ass backwards thing. Cause I could see like, uh, it almost seems like it would be easier to do the films uh, that, that existed beforehand. And the best way I can describe it is like kind of a passing of the torch, like we're seeing with Bill and Ted coming out this week with uh, Face the Music where, you know, the torch is getting passed to the daughters. You know, yeah. that's that's going to be the story arc. So they can make more Bill and Ted movies with them. Um, but, you know, like if we did a Goonies 2, you could do that because you could have Mouth and, and Mikey and and, uh, and Chunk as parents now, but they're teaching their kids about the, 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 the legends of the Goondocks, you know, and stuff like that. Whereas a brand new property would be so much harder because there's nothing to fall back on. Uh, Scotty Schwartz said it best with a with a Christmas story too, or Next Generation, where you could have like Flick and Ralphie and all that uh, with their kids. And I joked, I said it only works if Mikey turns out like his father, <laughs> <laughs> or Ralphie. Ralphie turns out like his father, where he's like, uh, 
you know, a turkey thief and arguing with the do- uh, neighbor's dogs and stuff. But I mean, <laughs> absolutely. And it, it, you're right. It, it is. It's a. It's a kind of a, a crazy way to, to think about how it could be. Like if it were the Goonies, you're right. You got to take all the parents, bring them back, because you got to show them. Right. But then you get these kids to take over, and maybe even like the Goonies are saying, like, you guys are the next generation Goonies. Get out. And like drop them off somewhere and say, okay, here you go. Go find this or do something. Almost right. Like like uh, yeah. Mikey. Mikey winds up finding out something else about One-Eyed Willie, and he knows he's too old, he's too responsible, he's got family and all that to take care of. So he hands it to Mikey Jr. and says, look, I did it when I was a kid, it's your turn. You know, type yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I think they would do something along one of them passes away, and now the kid is grieving and finds the adventure or finds what his father was looking for. Right. And then takes it up and goes, but... That general, that's such a trope that they use that it's just like, all right. I, I think I, I, you're right. It would be the easier way to say Mikey died and say, you know, just off the top of my head, at the end of the original Goonies, uh, when I really ship saw, sailed back out to sea. Well, you know, Mikey spent his life trying to find out where that ship went. So the son finds out after the funeral, that's where, you know, that's what his dad was working on. So it's like, well, go do it, you know. Uh, type deal. I could I could see that, but I I think I like the idea better where it's almost like instead of dad dying, dad says, "Look, I had my chance. It's your turn," and just hand it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that would be a cooler story, personally. Yeah, I think so. And it'd be it still keep the heartwarming version of it, you know, where mm-hmm. Mikey's you know Mikey's dealing with the <laughs> you know all the plight that his father was dealing with, you know, having to lose the house and stuff like that now. So, yeah, you know, well, I still maintain that town was a death trap and they should have gotten out. <laughs> yeah, that town was a death trap. Jesus, <laughs> that is awesome. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you wanted to have this conversation or were willing to have this conversation because uh, I had a blast with talking about it the other day. And I'm really excited. Like, I'm, I'm hoping filmmakers are listening to these podcasts that we just did, and maybe somebody will brainstorm the next generation of. of 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 kids buddy films i i think i I like to think i'm spearheading it yeah <laughs> well see your idea out there you'll know you you'll know they got to it hey, you um, know, I, I used to be an independent professional wrestler and there's i don't know how many times my tag team partner and myself would come up with a, a double team move that we know was never seen before so we're like right on we're gonna debut it we debuted it, it went over well looked great couple months later we see it on wcw and it's like oh yeah they're not watching the indies <laughs> yeah right oh man that's awesome i didn't know that that's that's really cool yeah I'm where, uh, where'd you wrestle out of? Uh, i wrestled uh i began in uh in gwa out of philadelphia but i've wrestled all the way from new jersey to colorado and from new york to florida so i i, I did right. it for a better part of 20 years <laughs> wow. i'm a fan i've never done it but uh, yeah, i'm definitely a fan so I was talking. I had a, um, a guest co-host because every every third. Uh, I'm sorry. Every Tuesday night, I'm losing track of my schedule. Okay. Every Tuesday night, I do a live podcast where I bring on a guest co-host and we talk about topics in the movie industry and pop culture today. Okay. And <laughs> I brought on uh, uh, Jesse L. Green. He was my co-host last week, and he uh, plays. He's Captain Decapitate down here in uh, uh, West Virginia and Maryland area. Uh, he's a he's, Pro wrestling. It was pro wrestling manager. Okay. And, uh, very cool. Uh, he was telling all the stories and stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm in. I was like, go ahead, just talk. I don't even want to talk about topics right now. Just tell me your stories. Um, <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you. I'll give you my career in an easy, in an easy to understand uh, nutshell. For most people that want to know about what it's like to be in the independent wrestling circuit, take your balls, lay them on a table, and just pound them with a wooden hammer. Then drop fifty cents for payment. <laughs> no, I I loved my time in the in the business, but uh, don't get it's definitely one of those business. Don't get into the get, don't go don't get in it to get rich. You're not gonna get rich. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's very familiar too. I I say that to a lot of filmmakers. I was like, you love it, do it, but do it for the love of it. But uh, no, that's absolutely great. What, uh, so you're still, if I'm understanding correctly, to get back into you and less about like just yakking about films, um, are you still involved in the indie movie scene or has ha- have you kind of like let that go wayside and, and put all your attention into uh, screen stops? 
Uh, the only thing I still do is occasionally I'll edit scripts. You know, I have friends who are writers and they'll, they'll send them to me and I'll, you know, maybe add some elements or something, but nothing major. Uh, I focus, most of my focus is on the scene stops and promoting indie filmmakers. Okay. Um, I do, I still have some of them come to me and want to produce, but it's, you know, I'm so focused on what I'm doing now. I, I got to kind of keep my uh, focus on that. But I do, I promote a lot of uh, indie filmmakers all over the East Coast to make sure or anywhere, really, if anybody wants to come on and talk to film, I'm fine with that. But uh, I'm producing, uh, producing, I'm um, promoting and uh I'm a sponsor of uh, that, my buddy's in the, uh, film festival this year, the Skyline Indie Film Festival, which is September 10th through the 13th. Um, and it's all virtual this year. So there's like 60 plus movies. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Scripts Gone Wild. They do. No, uh, what? I script. actually have. I actually have heard of, heard of it. Yeah, they're teaming up. Uh, I'm going to be on that on September 10th. We're doing The Princess Bride um, nice. for Skyline. All proceeds go to Skyline to help them out. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna have a great time with that. And, uh, that whole week of, uh, scene snob is going to be to promote Skyline and indie films and things like that. I'm going to be, uh, handling interviews with the filmmakers and things like that. So, but, and that's coming right off of another, <laughs> next week is our Star Trek week. Every, every night we have a live show. <laughs> that, that's kind of funny because, uh, as I was waiting to get this interview started, as I told you, I had to silence my TV. I was going through Star Trek Deep Space Nine on season seven right now. So it's kind of funny you're saying that. That was the noise in the background. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Yeah. That's, I think we have like 30 guests and panelists and stuff coming on from all over. Oh, wow. And just live show every night. And all of our pre recorded shows are going to be everything on the scenesnobs.com is going to be Star Trek based next week. Great. So I, I, it was going to be just the Friday night showcase with Star Trek. And I put it out there, a feeler, like two months ago. I was like, hey, you know, if I did a Star Trek showcase episode, who would want to come on? And I just got flooded with messages from people saying, I want to be on, I want to be on. And I was like, all right, we'll just do it all week. I was like, I can't. <laughs> it's the easiest way to do it. Uh, I was like, I'll get you all in there <laughs> somehow. We had a, a Star Wars show on, on Realm of the Mist known as War of the Stars, which it's still going on. It's just no longer part of Realm of the Mist. Uh, but we had started a uh, an adventure where we were taking a look at the main character and digging into the main characters of Star Wars, mainly the main trilogy, like Luke, Leia, and Vader. That series itself was so well received that what was supposed to be a four episode arc, we wound up going into like sea party characters. Like we were we were digging into characters you didn't even know were characters in Star Wars. You know what I mean? Like that, right. that that little robot that walked in the scene in uh in the cantina in episode four for literally point two seconds. Yeah, his name is this and this is his background story. And we like we researched the hell out of him and had a an episode about a character you barely saw in the film. <laughs> it's such an amazing universe, it really is. It's how open it is and every character has a background in some way. Uh it's amazing how they do it. That's why I'm um, laughing at this Star Trek thing where it's like it was supposed to be a one-time show and now it's all week. It's like, yeah, I remember how things go like that. <laughs> yeah, every every co-host or host of other shows that I had were all like, well, we want to do it too. Yeah, you know, and then I had all these guests and, and such and, and Star Trek experts or, you know, everybody was popping on. And I was like, all right. I was like, fine. So we're doing a script reading starting Sunday of right. a, a Star Trek TNG episode. Okay. And then... We have a panel on Monday, the world of Star Trek. We're going to have like five or six panelists on there talking. Um, then the Seasons podcast, Behind the Box podcast, our cult classic show. Uh, Rob Paints the Movies is going to be painting Star Trek. And then the showcase. And I have a couple of interviews and other other things going on too. So it's very Star Trek that week. <laughs> Well, I can say I can say this much, and hopefully he'll watch the episode and feel special about this. I don't want to throw a monkey wrench into your plans here, but if you could invite, if you still have spaces open to invite anybody on the show about uh, that, as far as like being an expert on Star Trek, I highly recommend a gentleman named Joe Cahill. He's a film he's a film director, uh, indie film director out of California, but he is a huge 
Star Trek fan. Absolutely huge. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the series, but I couldn't even begin to touch the knowledge this gentleman has. So. <laughs> yeah, hey, listen, if you want to send him my way, tell him to message me, and I'll uh, be more than happy to uh, uh, add him to the fray. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Joe, if you're listening, man, contact this gentleman here. He'll, he'll get you going, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll not make a liar out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I love Star Trek, but I, I am not. I probably know less than most people like, but I love the idea of it. So I love hearing other people talk about it. And that's kind of what this came from. I was like, I'll shut up. You guys talk and I'll learn. And that's all it will be. Right. So, that, that's kind of. That's kind of how I am with Star Trek. It's like I enjoy watching the episodes. I and, uh, and I enjoy them for what they are. Like, you know, I know I know most of the Star Trek fan base for for sake of argument hate like Star Trek Enterprise. I love Enterprise because I love oh, the rawness of Enterprise. I know continuity-wise, it, it breaks a lot of story arcs in, in a sense, but just the overall arc of the Enterprise, the first ever Enterprise on, on the first mission before Starfleet existed, you know, with a rough and tumble crew that doesn't have the, 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 the uh, prime directive to fall back on, like that was a very appealing thing to me watching that show. And I think, I think it ended before it's time. I really do. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a, that was a great show. I, I, I don't think there's a Star Trek show, live action show, that I disliked. Like, at Discovery, I'm kind of, I'll still watch it, though. You know, it's still Star Trek in a way. Picard was still, it was still reminiscent of the old, you know, and, and brought back memories that I was like, all right, I'll still watch it. But, but you know what, uh, Discovery, I'm right there with you. I hated the first season, but uh, the second season of Discovery, it, it pulled me in because of the Enterprise and Chris Pike. You know, mm -hmm. like when they brought real Star Trek into the universe, you know, for Discovery is when it started getting interesting to me. Um, quite honestly, I just don't like the crew of the, uh, the Discovery. They're, they're, they're not appealing to me. Yeah. That, that being said, though, um, with picard and star trek and and star trek discovery and everything else the greatest star trek show in modern time right now in my opinion is the orville <laughs> oh I was, and i was so mad to learn that he brought that to them and said you should do this show and they completely turned it down and said no we don't want to take star trek in that direction and i'm just like but why not he's not saying the enterprise he's saying just this and now they're doing it. Now they're doing it with lower decks. And mm -hmm. uh, they, they're, you see them copying the style of the Orville in a lot of ways. And it's like, you could have had it. You could have had Seth MacFarlane, who is such a huge fan of Star Trek, mm -hmm. um, doing this. And he knows everything about it, you know? So uh, <laughs> that's, the funniest th that's the funniest thing to me about Orville is that Seth MacFarlane, who's known for Ted and known for Family Guy and How to, A Thousand Ways to Die in the West, like raunchy, irrelevant comedies, comes out with this uh, with this space adventure uh, show, and the first thing I thought when when they first announced it, I'm like, it, it, it's it's satire. It's just gonna spoof the shit. It's blazing saddles in space. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm not gonna take it as anything more than that. Like I'd be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if there's non sequitur uh, segments where we cut back to some reference thing, like they do in Family Guy. Like you know, and instead. I got intelligent science fiction out of it. Like, of course, it's oh, got yeah. the, the pee and poop jokes that Seth MacFarlane's Farland, known for, but there is intelligent and thought-provoking science fiction hidden in a comedy show. <laughs> and that's just, not even just that. It's even, you know, not getting into politics side, but, like, even, like, the, the way of thinking and the social cues that you take. It's just like TNG or Deep Space Nine or anything else. Like, it fits... You're right. It fits perfectly in with all of those shows, you know. And like when you say the the one episode that pops in the mind was the society that ha all walked around with the the buttons with the thumbs up and thumbs down. They all like <laughs> rated each other on likes and dislikes, you know, in, in their own oh, society. You know, like you're right. They he, he even though it's presented in a in a comedy format, it's still intelligent, thought provoking science fiction with social undertones it, it, it's really really invented and quite honestly i mean I, I know i shouldn't give this comparison but 
I think it falls under the comedy uh, satire with with intelligence vein of something like Galaxy Quest. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And yeah, it's funny because my wife isn't a huge science fiction fan. She'll watch some sci-fi sh- uh, movies and such, but really never shows. And when I would talk to her about Star Trek, she's like, "No, I'm I'm good. I'm not interested." We I made her watch the Orville. Right. She is. She, I think she's more invested than I am. And I love that. Show. It's one of my favorites. And it's led her to watching more Star Trek. Nice. Because now she realizes, because I think she saw Discovery and was uh, and then saw this, saw the Orville and was like, yeah, that's not the same thing. But then we go back and I'm like, but watch TNG. Right. You, know, you may have heard of it. You may know who Patrick Stewart is, but this is what it is. And she, <laughs> so she gets into it more and more now. You know, it's it's funny because uh, the older Star Treks made me go back to the uh, original series. Uh, Orville actually made me appreciate the original series more. Uh, you know, because obviously I'm I'm you know I'm 43 years old. I was a baby at best when they were syndicating the original series. When the when the animated cartoon was on for two years, you know, mm-hmm. I was I was still pooping in my diaper. So. You know, the first real exposure to Star Trek I had was Next Generation, which later gave Deep Space Nine and Voyager. And, you know, most people most people know, know Star Trek that way. But I watched the original series because of the movies and then the, the Next Generation stuff made me go back to the original series. But I never really appreciated it as much. Like the movies I loved, the original six movies I loved. But the original series, it was just too campy and too too low budget for me. I was spoiled by modern technology um (laughs) but then things like the orville and galaxy quest made me go back and watch the series the original series and the uh the original cartoon and have a better appreciation for what they were trying to achieve with such a low budget you know which made me love the series more yeah i do i you know i have a show on uh, my channel called the behind the box podcast which is a cult classic so we talk about mostly horror of course but Right. Um, last episode we did uh, cult TV shows, okay, and we did. You know, it kind of led to probably the most famous cult TV show of all time was Star Trek. Was Star Trek? You know, most people did not find it until the eighties, mm-hmm. and right because TNG came back out and like kind of you know the movies were kind of taking off after Wrath of Khan, and uh, people were just like, all right, let's revisit it, and it was in syndication, so they went right back to it, right. You know, and that's that. Yeah, that's what led to you know everybody kind of being re, you know reviving it and, and kind of running with it to now where how many shows and how many movies and such. So, you know, it's it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great franchise. I really wish the Orville was a part of it, but even though it's not, it's still an amazing show. Oh, to me, Orville is a part of it. It's just uh, may not be canon, but it's there. <laughs> and it's so easily can be done it can be brought in the canon like you can work that in absolutely but uh, yeah. i'll tell you what i'm gonna i'm gonna piss off every star trek fan right now every star <laughs> trek fan. i'm gonna i'm gonna answer the unanswerable argument kurt or picard and it's very simple archer <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that too many people would disagree with you honestly nice no, it's Scott Bakula, but the, the character of Jonathan Archer, I think the way he was portrayed in the show, he, he really, truly was, I think, the, I think he had the best of Picard and Kirk in him, you know, yeah. uh, because he had the adventurous devil may care uh, cowboy instincts of, of Archer, but he did have the diplomatic and, and intelligent uh, persona behind him as well of, of Picard. Just the difference between him and Picard is Picard had the prime directive in years of the Federation where Archer was pioneering all that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got a, and somebody brought up too, because we're getting, you know, we're planning everything out and get everything together. And they brought up Cisco and how Cisco, out of all the captains, Cisco's the only one that's not a Starship captain. But he's he is. A, you know, He's a, well, it, not really. He's you know, Deep Space Nine is he's not so much Starship as he is like because he, but he's they're still putting him in the Defiant. Yeah, but from everybody's point of view, is like he's not an explorer like everybody else. Okay, is. that's fair. Yeah, you know, so like he's not, and he 
for that seven years, it was him on Deep Space Nine for the most part. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really like even being a part of a starship. Um, you know, so like, and he's not Picard because he'll lie if he has to. Right. He'll, he shows that he's, you know, he took out Q with one punch. Q never came back after that punch, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, so he can be violent if he needs to, like Kirk. And he also doesn't maintain that prodigy that Kirk was, you know. Right. Kirk, Kirk was meant for being a captain of a starship. You know, and, and then Archer, as much as he's starting out, like, I, was, I would compare Cisco and Archer probably the closest, you know? That's fair. That's fair. And, yeah. and, and you know, the, 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 truth, the truth be told is it's hard to compare the captains because each captain uh, from each series, they are the best fit characters for the environments that they're in. Kirk was perfect for a ship out on a five-year mission to explore where nobody's explored before. Archer was perfect to be the person who ushers in the era of the Federation. Uh, uh, Picard, this is the pinnacle of the Federation, and he is the pinnacle captain of the Federation on the pinnacle ship of the Federation. But then you have your 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 people like uh, like uh, you know Cisco, who is out on the fringe handling unknown uh, uh, enemies from a different sector of space that's never been explored thanks to a wormhole, plus handling, uh, you know, a civil war dispute between the Cardassians and the Majorans, all at the same time trying to, trying to balance this, 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 you know, hard, uh, uh, fragile piece, uh, you know, uh, of all of it, you know, like a tripod in a sense. And then you look at somebody like Janeway, and she was perfect for what she had to do because she's the first ship that's out in the Delta Quadrant with no way home. And she had to learn to be the captain of Voyager in a world where she did not have the Federation to fall back on. There was no Federation where she was. So I think, I think you know, it, 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 when, I, when I take the jokes away, I think each captain was fitting for the environment that they had to, that they, that they existed in. I don't think Kirk would have done well in Janeway's position. I don't think uh, Picard would have done well in Archer's position. I certainly don't think Archer would have done well in, in Cisco's position because they were tailored for the position they were in. Yeah. And that's, and that's why I think the, the fun part about all of this, uh, each series is the captains that we follow, they have a legacy. There's a lot of captains, there's a lot of admirals, there's a lot of other people we don't ever see again. Right. You know, they just hop on, you know, they, they've earned their rank and that's it. But we follow them because they do, they are there doing the important things for their time and their era. So, and that's why I always love that. That's why I love the world of Star Trek. And that's why I'm excited about the panel is bringing people on to explain it to me. What do you think? <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm curious about that, and maybe I misunderstood. I want to make sure I got this right. One of the episodes that you're going to be doing is where you're going to reenact an episode? Yeah, we're doing a script reading of uh, Cupid, the uh, TNG episode where uh, Q sticks the Enterprise crew into the world of Robin Hood. Ah, uh, yes, with the most famous fra uh, phrase, Captain, I protest, I am not a merry man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm excited to do that one. We're getting a bunch of people, like some other co-hosts, but we're getting other Star Trek fans out and things like that. And other podcasters and stuff are jumping in. So, well, how 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 are you going to do it? Are you going to do it uh, like uh, beat for beat from the TV show, or is it going to be more like a radio drama? Where more you like have a radio narration. Drama. Yeah, I'll I'll narrate it, and we'll have the uh, you know we'll have everybody a different character on Zoom, and we're just gonna. Read, uh, read it off our parts as we go nice nice i'll have to check that out you have to you have to send me the link when you're doing it <laughs> we'll do definitely Absolutely. i would have to be a part of it. i would have to be a part of it but i would just be one of the guys that died <laughs> uh, we are pretty stocked up but i do have ensemble pieces <laughs> but, uh, yeah no absolutely but we do have room for uh on the showcase and the um uh, panel if you're interested you want to jump in so I know that's monday know. The thirty first and September fourth, that Friday. Oh wow! So. I might, I might have to do it, uh, even though I'm sure nobody wants to talk to me about Star Trek. I'm, 
I'm hey, listen, like I, said, I want to hear what people have to say. Nobody wants to hear what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, it'll be, uh, definitely. It's going to be a fun time. Just get a bunch of people that talk about something we love. Nice. That is awesome. Well, well, why don't we take a moment here and tell everybody, besides what you see on screen there, the scene snobs.com, tell everybody where they can find your shows and your, and your podcasts. And if they want to get in contact with you, maybe they have some questions. Maybe they have some things about Star Trek or, or independent films they'd love to bring your way. Uh, just the way they can contact you. Uh, well, you can uh, message me on the scene snobs on Facebook. Uh, if you need links to everything, uh, social media, our YouTube channel, uh, our, and any of the podcasts. Our podcasts are available on all pot, on all platforms, so you can go check those out. But uh, go to thescenesnobs.com. We have links to everything. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, The Scene Snobs. Uh, you can at The Scene Snob on Twitter, at The Scene Snob on Instagram. You can message me anywhere, and I'll get it. Um, you, usually, Facebook is the best way to message me uh, because that's – just kind of where everything connects right now uh and that's where everybody seems to be you know but twitter instagram wherever you want you know and my email's on there so you that, can always email as well. that is awesome and i've definitely got to uh invite you on to the breaking the fourth walls new uh weekly show uh which we do i'm actually releasing the next episode tomorrow uh, <laughs> but uh it would i think you would have a blast sitting on and just bullshitting and being stupid with us for a couple hours uh so i will definitely have to have you back on especially if i uh, invite you to be a guest on uh, one of our our weekly shows i think you'd have a blast with it thank you so much I, that would be awesome i, you know, I, I love talking shop so <laughs> well, uh, uh, well we have a resident uh movie buff uh chris rudder who uh who primarily runs his own podcast called uh, what's your F and binge which deals with like tv and movies and you know, the, the, it's a cool little concept because he, his guest that he has on comes on with an idea of a show or a movie they want to discuss. And the deal is, is that he's got to figure out what it is without you telling him. Really? So you're, oh, giving, it's almost like a game show. You're giving out clues and, 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 and stuff like that, but he, you're not allowed to give the title. He's got to figure it out. All right. I think that'd be pretty, I'm thinking of things. I got things swirling. I'm not even on the show. I'm like, yeah, I'm try that. Um, no, but that, that's a really cool concept. That's awesome. Yeah. So he's, he's our okay. resident movie buff. I think, I think he would get a kick out of having a, having a little debate with you about something. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. I, yeah. That sounds amazing. I would, you know, I'd love to, if you have me. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on your show. This is great. Oh, no, I did. Pleasure is mine. The honor is mine. Uh, as I said before, breaking the fourth wall, the, the interview in incarnation would not exist without our guests. I'm not the host. You guys are. I'm just here to ask the questions. But <laughs> <All right. laughs> your guys are sure. <laughs> Which, by the way, guys, if you enjoyed this episode in any capacity, hit that thumbs up button, like, share, comment, subscribe. Check out all the other podcasts of Breaking the Fourth Wall, including our weekly podcast uh, releasing every Tuesday. And, of course, guys, if you prefer your podcast in audio-only format, Look up Realm of the Mist Entertainment on Anchor.fm, Apple iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, or wherever quality podcasts can be heard. Again, I want to thank Mike for coming on. This has been an absolute blast. I can't wait to, to I guess I'm joining the panel. You might as well put me on the list because uh, you're in. <laughs> I, want to, I want to get a chance to sit down and listen to real intelligent Star Trek fans and realize how dumb I am. <laughs> I, yeah i have nothing to offer i'm just gonna be there like you said asking the questions <laughs> you guys tell me what you think. I appreciate you me on. thank you so much this Ab great. absolutely and guys i will catch you on the next breaking the fourth wall have a good night Hey guys, it's Chris from Realm of the Mist Entertainment. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Check out all the other great podcasts that can be found on Realm of the Mist Entertainment's YouTube channel or our sister channel, Sounds Dicey Gaming, for all your tabletop needs. And if you prefer your podcasts in audio-only format, check out Realm of the Mist Entertainment on Anchor.fm, Apple iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever quality podcasts can be heard. To our Patreon supporters, we thank you very, very much. And if you're interested in being a Patreon supporter, please go over to patreon.com slash realm of the mist and just a dollar a month gives you exclusive content and helps our channel out greatly. 
Guys, again, thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you on the next episode.